welcome everyone um, to the Minera Amos live event today hosted by SIX. I'm very pleased to introduce Doug Ramshaw, the president of Minera Amos. In this event, we're going to discuss the five reasons in five, roughly five minutes, why Minera Amos. So, um, and after that, we will be accepting questions live. So as a reminder, feel free to submit questions at any time using the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of the screen. And we'll try to get to them after the presentation portion is over. And as always, uh, this is being recorded and available to watch afterwards on six.com. But without any further ado, Doug, I'm gonna pass it off to you to uh, go through the five reasons why. Thanks, Dasher. And yes, apologies in advance, I kind of, uh bastardize the format a little bit. It's five reasons in five slides, not five minutes. Anyone who knows me knows I can take five minutes to drink a glass of water to, to give five key points in five minutes. A little little limiting, but uh, we'll keep it punchy and, uh, and hopefully it will present uh, an opportunity to ask some questions on either the points I've raised today or, or other things which uh, have failed to be main mentioned. I will be ma making a few forward-looking statements, probably one big one as well. So um, obviously uh, bear that in mind. Okay, the theme for this year for Monera, I think um, I have to give credit to a banker in uh, in Toronto who who mentioned to me back in January that the Monera business model is is so perfectly suited for this current inflationary environment we're in. You know, we said, look, you built your first mine for 10 million US. What are your next two mines? Maybe 60 million US combined. Um, you know, if you saw a 30% cost overrun on your CapEx, it's 20 million bucks. It's 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 not a deal breaker like we've seen on other things. It's an annoyance, but with the first mine up and running, it's more than manageable. So so something I absolutely will be pounding the table with this year is, you know, we have a smart business plan. It's not sexy, but it's smart. Um, and I think will serve us and our shareholders extremely well in when, when the industry is facing uh, major inflation, inflationary pressures, both on the OPEX and, and obviously the CAPEX. Ounces in the ground. This kind of goes back to the, the Monera business model of bootstrapping. It goes back to the previous slide, which is by bootstrapping these projects and starting small and scaling up organically. Um, you know, our, our starting resources are all in that kind of plus or minus half million ounce range. Um, can they grow? Absolutely. Will they grow? Yeah, that's our, that's our intent. That's why we're developing projects on a, on a smaller footprint to start with to scale up. It's a key component of what assets we go after is we have to have visibility on how they grow. And that means those ounces that we expand uh, the resources out of uh, out of cash flow are genuine brownfield ounces. So, you know, right now, would I rather have small projects where we can define ounces that very quickly can be put on a leech pad and turned into real dollars? Or do I want to have something where I can arm wave that I got five or six million ounces of low grade gold is going to require huge capex, which then presents all the challenges at those inflationary pressures. So, you know, and the heat leach, uh, again, it's, it's smart, not sexy. You know, you're not going to get crazy headline, you know, drill results from us showing high grade gold in core pitches. Um, but, Grade isn't king, margin is. And open pit heat bleach, which really isn't a sexy mining style, um, you know, is a is a great way to protect yourself in these environments. And and honestly, you know, a lot of the great mining companies we see today started out on, you know, far from sexy open pit heat bleach assets. So that's our skill set, and that's what we're going to uh, drive our growth from. And that growth comes from Cerro de Oro, which is a game changer. Obviously, Santana, where we we built, we built in that during the pandemic, and it's going through its ramp up now. Uh, I think back to something I said about Santana three years ago when I was presenting Minera Alamos. Santana, I said at the time, was it was the starter motor. It got things up and running. Um, thereafter, it was going to be a lower cost operation um, in La Fortuna that was going to be the engine, um, really driving growth forward. Santana hasn't changed. It's still the starter motor. 
Um, it's important because you get up and you start generating positive cash flow. The key was always it would allow you to take some debt on to build the second project. Now, that second project has changed from La Fortuna to an asset we picked up in the fall of 2020 called Cerradoro, another open pit heap leach operation. Um, it's going to be a very big mine. We have uh, in we've done some initial internal scoping purely off the the starting maiden resource we put out in November 2020. We know it can be a lot bigger than that. Um, you know the the numbers um. The numbers are good enough that I absolutely want to frame these into a PEA, uh, hopefully Q3 of this year. Um, it will be a very robust uh, and conservatively modeled PEA. And even with that degree of conservatism, uh, I expect um, I expect uh, the numbers are going to uh, be very, very well uh, received by the market. Um, you know, it's fair to say Cerro de Oro has been a frustration in one aspect, uh, one that I hope uh, this will be about the last time I'm presenting where I'm talking about the surface rights not having been received. Um, and I, I'm happy to address that in the Q&A. So if someone can ask me the question in the Q&A about Cerro de Oro surface rights, I'll do it then um, because I, I don't want to get off the format of this kind of bullet point of uh, uh and i think i've got two more to come organic production growth um not only can we build mines um with limited capex that that helps in this environment and everything else uh we can build them sequentially and relatively rapidly by industry standards and that goes goes to the ju jurisdiction we're in in mexico where the permitting timelines are uh, pretty short. Uh, when you're developing initial mines at scale, anywhere between 25, 30,000 ounces or 60 or 70,000 ounces to start, you're not talking about huge permitting operations like in Canada and stuff, which can take many years to permit. Um, and that allows us to build these things incrementally, rapidly, um, and deliver organic production growth. Um, notwithstanding the fact that each of these projects, when we start them out, is just the first iteration of their production profile. So there can be a real compounding of that production growth should we uh, we deliver on both uh, expansions of these projects as well as bringing on a number uh, back to back. And finally, um, and this is something very close to my heart, and, and pretty evident in my CDI filings over the last, uh, well, six months and 12 months. I think in the last 12 months, I bought a million shares and in the last six, 500,000 of those. Um, but we, we look at it in all aspects of our, our company. I mean, so it's not just the share purchases, uh, how we approach stock option awards. We do them to start with infrequently um, the last one we did, I think, were the first times we've issued them in 18 months. And when we did so, we issued them at a considerable premium to market. Um, I think at the time, the stock was trading around 60 cents. We set them at 72, but that didn't end there. We also tied their vesting to meaningful production um, milestones. We didn't put it in the press release at the time. I believe it's in our MDNA. Um, for those to vest on a quarterly basis, you know, 25% vesting uh, uh, basis, uh, each 25% of that option grant only vests upon reaching 50,000 ounces of cumulative gold production. So for us as management to see those options have value, we will, in their entirety, we will have had to have produced 200,000 ounces of cumulative gold production from our operations within a five-year period. Now, we absolutely believe that's going to happen. and We probably wouldn't have set the vesting on, on those conditions if we didn't have a plan to actually be able to do it. Um, but I think it was important because I think when we are speaking to shareholders and expect shareholders to put their after-tax dollars at risk, it is very important for management to align their rewards or their purchases 
with those very same shareholders. Um, and, you know, we are in it with you. We're not in it for ourselves because of you. So I, I would say that Monero ranks very, very highly in our, in our peer group in terms of that alignment with our shareholders. And it's something that's very close to my heart and I'm very proud of. Now, with that, I'm sure we can turn to a question about surface uh, rights at Cerro de Aurora, but uh, I don't want to preempt any other questions that come in. So uh, that was five bullet points uh, that I think separates Monero. Um, and it certainly makes Monero a, a very interesting story for the coming years. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, the you know what I like about these kinds of presentations is hearing from from shareholders or potential shareholders alike, and happy to ask answer any questions that might come in. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doug. Um, of course, the question that you requested has come up. So, can you please tell us more about the surface rights at Zero de Oro? Well, it's funny you should ask that question. <laughs> um, so. Cerro Oro is a very interesting project. It's the first one that our team has built that actually sits within the municipal boundaries of a nearby town. So 95% of the land that we'd need to develop that mine um, actually fell within those boundaries. And we had those surface rights tied up middle of last year because it was just an agreement that needed to be done when you're dealing with the mayor of the town. Um, a lot of companies, not saying all, um, but a lot of companies probably would have pushed ahead with a mine plan based around that ground. But it wasn't the optimal ground for an operation we saw at the scale that it can be. Um, and so rather than doing things in a rushed or premature way, this is where I'll always defer to our excellent team in Mexico. They said, no, it's going to take more time to do it right. It's caused me, and I'm sure our shareholders, immense frustration. <laughs> um, you know, and there have been a number of times where we thought, uh, you know, we had everything tied up. Uh, this is, um, you know, but it, but they weren't. And, and I think I look back to pre-pandemic, I was incredibly proud of us being spot on with our guidance and on timings of everything. Uh, I used to have a slide about it because we were so accurate on that. And I've hated the fact that timelines have become more fluid over the last couple of years. Um, the funny thing is, to some extent, I wish we didn't have to give timelines. But if a, if a shareholder was to ask, when is someone, we're expected to. So we give guidance based on the most accurate information we have at hand at the time. Uh, most recently, uh, we thought before the BMO mining event in March, uh, end of February, beginning of March, that we'd have them right around that time. But there were still some more meetings. These surface rights, often it's, it's back and forth with local community members, um, you know, in terms of this last bit of land we want. And it's not that there's any... Um, distaste for mining. Cerro de Oro is in probably our best located project in, in northern Zacatecas. It's fantastic. They, all the people around there are very pro-mining. Um, they either work directly or have indirect work from a lot of the large mines in the area. And and so it's, it's not a, a question of you're dealing with two groups of people. Some are opposed to mining, some are, are against it. Um, but there's there's a procedure and it's like the back and forth on negotiations on your 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 pricing and everything else. You don't want to create dangerous precedents. So you take your time and that time is in the interest of our shareholders, uh, but it does cause a lot of frustration. So I don't want to put a time on it, but it's really close. Um, and I, I'm probably going to get guidance that would help me in saying how close towards the end of this week. I don't have it for you now, but it's it's close and it's not hung up because of the government. It's not hung up because of uh, anti-mining elements. Um, it's just procedural. Um, the final step is a final meeting down there where we, we get an agrarian uh, attorney uh, come in uh, to, to ratify everything was done correctly. Uh, and then we're away to the races. And within two months of getting those surface rights, We'll have the project into permitting, all the engineering, all the works ready to go. 
our consultants, permitting consultants down there believe it's uh, about an eight month permitting process, um, highlighting again, the attractions of, of, of these things in Mexico. Um, so that would still, even if it's uh, two months from end of next week to, to going into permitting, so call it end of July, um, we're, we're still factoring, you know, getting those permits right around the end of Q1 next year. And if that's the case with a roughly six month build, you know, Cerador can be on, on stream um, before the end of 2023. So, and it, and it really is a big game changer project for us because I think it rapidly pushes us to kind of uh, that 100,000 ounce production um, uh, profile with Fortuna waiting in the wings and, and really hopefully being able to leave the kind of uh, junior producer world, that sub 100,000 ounce producer world behind us. So um, it's, it's been frustrating though, and I, I, I think our shareholders have shown incredible patience with us during this, and I, I think that patience will genuinely be rewarded in due course. Thank you. Um, Paul is saying, uh, Mexico recently nationalized lithium rights. In your view, um, are gold and copper next? I don't think so, no. Um, I think uh, lithium or was something that AMLO you know, had talked up, um, uh, wanted to make the point. I mean, this, there isn't some extensive lithium industry in Mexico. I, uh, there's really only one major project, Bacanora is one that is now owned by the Chinese, that is any kind of um, advanced lithium project in Mexico. So um, there was talk at the time about energy stuff. So copper was also raised, but you know, some wholesale nationalizing of of uh, the Mexican mining industry that is a big contributor, but is, is supported by big investment from companies that, you know, in, in North America. Um, yeah, it, I don't believe it's going to uh, lead to other commodities. Uh, I think lithium was, um, it was a, it was an odd one to make so many headlines because it's not like there's some extensive lithium industry in, in Mexico. It's not like the lithium triangle of, of South America. So, um, you know, a lot, of, you know, is, was there a lot of uh, political, you know, statements being made by AMLO on it, you know, um, populist kind of stuff? Maybe it's, it wouldn't be the first time, um, but I don't see it uh, translating to to copper, uh, silver, gold, um, uh, where where the investment you know is has been made, it would be very hard. I I think you'd probably have some major issues with the USM USMCA as well in in that regard too. Okay, thank you. Our next question here is: Will you continue to develop projects without compliant feasibility studies? Um. In terms of feasibility studies, I, I would very much think that we're not ever going to do a feasibility study. A compliant economic study, um, we have one for, for Tuna, it's PEA. PEAs come in different qualities. I think the PEAs we put together are very good. Um, Cerradora will have a PEA. Um, Santana was a bit of an anomaly. Um, did it make sense delay it for a year and spending a whole bunch of money when, in fact, you know, the project we inherited there had better than feasibility study met, for example. Um, you know, uh, most feasibility studies on a heap leach wouldn't have, you know, wouldn't have met data that was supported by a 50,000 ton bulk heap leach test pad that was done at site. So, we had, a, I think, a better handle on the metallurgical characteristics of Santana than if we put it into a feasibility study. And to be perfectly frank, feasibility studies have been found to be woefully inaccurate over the years, routinely, not just some outliers. Um, and again, I think that's one of the other beauties of projects that can be rapidly taken from resource and a PEA into production the more you can tighten up that timeline, the less likelihood a CapEx number that appears in a PEA is going to be woefully inaccurate 
to five years later uh, when that project's built. Um, we're seeing that right now. Um, so many of these projects where construction was built under one set of operating assumptions are now finding significant funding shortfalls, um, which is tough when you say you're, you, you've invested $700 million in a project and now you've realized you've got another 1.3 billion to go as opposed to 600 million. Um, you know, that's where companies can get into real trouble. And yeah, those projects have the kind of scale and require the kinds of uh, lending uh, requirements that require that kind of study. But at the same time, the, the time it takes to then build them, those studies, I think, often are, are shown to be inaccurate just because of the length of time that's passed between the study being created and an operation being built. So we will, you know, Cerro de Aurora, within two months of picking up that project, we put out a 43101 resource on it. And part of that was to send the message, look, we're not cowboys. We want to do things by the book. Santana was an outlier. Uh, even that will have a, a maiden 43101 resource coming out soon. Um, just the first iteration to kind of support the first part of the mine life there. And it will grow in time as we expand our exploration to some of the other targets and build ounces there. Uh, but Cerro de Oro, we put one out within two months because I want to absolutely make sure the market realizes that you know we're not averse to filing stuff on CEDAR with a nice little bow for everyone to see. Um, and and that's why you know we've made the determination, which will make my life easier, which will make the analysts' lives easier, which will make shareholders lives easier in in understanding our projects of coming out with a pea for for the Cerro de Aurora project yeah that's one of the questions is when can we expect the 43 101 documents on Santana we got uh, should be before the end of this quarter so that gives us about six weeks I go six seven weeks we're just actually right now determining what gold price to use um it's an interesting question uh where where do you use it what what gold price do you model your your uh, your resource at? I mean, I know if you're one of the majors, they'll all stress test up stuff at twelve fifty. You know, and they value their reserves them at twelve fifty gold price. Um, you know, and we're not a barrack or a Newmont. Uh, one thing I'll say is our business model was conceived in a twelve fifty gold environment to uh, to work in a twelve fifty gold environment. I think we're very very insulated in terms of any reversal in gold. Uh, I'm not going to prognosticate as to where gold could go. Uh, all I know is on the downside, our business model stays intact. And I think that's really important. Um, obviously, if it goes the other way, we're, we're there to take advantage of it. But I was having this question the other day, like when we did the resource for Cerro Doro and likely the PEA, which will be based the base PEA will just be based off that resource, we'll use 1450 gold, uh, which I think is very conservative against the studies coming out right now. Um, for a project like Santana, where we're taking those ounces right now, putting them on the pad, should, you know, do we use 1450? Do we use 15? Do we use 1600? It's like at least these are ounces that conceivably are going to be turned into dollars very rapidly and sh short of a major couple of hundred dollar reversal in the gold price. I think, you know, there's a flaw that's been set there now. So um, we're just making that determination as to what gold price to use. But I think the beauty of ounces that we're developing that very rapidly are turned into the very gold that's contained within that rock, um, you know, gives us a little bit of flexibility there. But overall, I think, you know, the key point is, you know, when we're using prices, we always tend to err to the side of being cautious. I think most PEAs now would not be using 14, 50 gold in them, but I'm pretty sure that's what we'll use for uh, the base case for uh, Cerro de Oro. And I think it underscores um, why we're building a business model that, that can support the highs and lows of the gold cycles. I think part of the problem with our business is it is very cyclical and for the longest time you know the bigger producers would trade with those cycles because there wasn't that uh, or there was 
a reluctance to really take a more conservative approach to when buying assets and and everything else. And uh, I think there's been a long-standing knock on the sector and why we don't see the generalists pouring in um, as much as some would think should happen because they've been bitten in the past. And so if, if we can emulate, um, uh, you know, a business model, you know, like some of the majors are now starting to achieve, which is is not a cyclical business model. I think that's a, a good company to try, you know, to try to be. All right, thank you. Um, lots of questions here. Um, given that you expect to be cash flow positive on Santana this year, will the delay in Cerro de Oro affect how much financing you may wish uh, to take on? Um, they going to say you've been very open that you may take on modest amount of financing. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I think we'll lose our debt-free badge of honor. Um, you know, I, it was important to be debt-free when building the first mine, um, so we took a royalty instead. Uh, you know, Cerro de Oro is, at a guess, it's going to be about twenty-five million US to build. I have no problems taking on a bit of debt to uh to help support that in fact i would love post pa to kind of line up what that debt component could be so that the market is aware that as when we get those permits we've got the funding in place that there aren't any unpleasant surprises um with cerro de oro there definitely comes a an additional um line of expense um, you know, as we start advancing that, I mean, we've got drill pro programs mapped out to do at Cerro de Oro this year, both infill and expansion drilling, probably, you know, 10,000 meters of drilling at Cerro de Oro. There's, there's obviously the permitting work itself and, um, and, and other stuff we want to do down there as well, because we've been finding other, uh targets that we really want to wrap our heads around so um but overall i mean i think this is the beauty of of that starter motor that was santana is if we are debt free you know i'm not going to wear it like a badge of honor it's it's been good to this point but i have no problem it, it will be more efficient for us to uh to look for taking on a modest amount of debt for a project like that um to be honest, if gold prices hung up at fourteen fifty or fifteen hundred dollar gold, which is where we'll model that PEA, the payback on it will be so quick that I don't even view that debt as anything more than a short term bridging loan. Um, this is not something that we'll see years and years of payback um, to to deplete uh, that number. Uh, so you know, I'm pretty pretty comfortable with where we're at right now. Thank you. Uh, Jim's asking, is there an aspirational sense of how many ounces you think you might be producing in four to five years if all goes to plan? Um, yeah, I mean, I, from a personal point of view and, and looking at what we have now, um, you know, my hope is, I mean, actually, I hope we can do it before five years, but, uh, but I want to build this company into a plus 200,000 ounce a year producer and not just for the sake of getting a, a number of ounces produced, the kind of quality ounces which are going to deliver meaningful margin to both reinvest into the company to expand it. Um, but hopefully, you know, again, looking to emulate, you know, bigger companies in what we do. Um, you know, build build projects which have sufficient margin where honest to goodness, there isn't, you know, it would be inefficient to try to just reinvest all of that for the sake of reinvesting it in the business. The, you know, the ultimate goal for me, you know, would be to, to see a return of capital to shareholders, to have, to be able to build a production base that's spitting off so much cash that you can do a blend of, dividends and buybacks and the like. I sure as hell know that every time I, I buy stock in the company, I'm not seeing that money again. So maybe selfishly building a business model that's aligned with generating enough cash 
that we can pay a dividend, hey, at least, you know, there's a nice dividend check that can come in in due course. But uh, first things first, it's about executing, getting these multiple mines built out. But it is, I think, quite conceivable that we can build that 200,000 ounce a year producer uh, in that four to five year uh, range, if not sooner. Um, uh, but you know, in light of what I was saying about timelines right now, let's let's use five years as the outside date. Uh, yeah, I guess another timeline question about the construction start of Cerro de Oro. Um, Kevin's asking, it, right now it's HQ 2023. Do you see the upside moving close to HQ 2022? Um, so in a, in a perfect world, um, if, we, if we were to have surface rights, you know, in the next two or three weeks or say around the end of uh, the month uh, in a perfect world. It's about two months from there before the permit applications we've got all ready to go can be submitted. And that's that's because the last thing that needs to happen is some uh, baseline and uh, flora fauna um, uh, surveys that can't be done without all those surface rights. So, uh, our, consult, our permitting consultants have said within 10 months of surface rights, two months for those surveys, eight months for permitting, um, we should be getting our permits back. So on that basis, we're talking right around the end of Q1 next year. Now, um, Q1, early Q2. Construction could start immediately upon receipt of, of, of the uh, etj mir um, permits, um, and that's as little as five months, you know. But let's say six months. It's um, from a from an open pit heat bleach perspective, it's a really nice area we're in. There's huge areas of flat ground for for what are going to be very large leach pads. Um, the leach pad we're thinking of permitting has you know a hundred million tons of capacity. Um, not just for our starting operation, but for the expansions we see thereafter. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would hope worst case scenario, we've, we've had our first blast and mining has commenced before the end of next year. Um, could it, could we have been going through a few months at the ramp up by, by end of next year, or is it a first? first blast on Christmas Day 2023. I, I, I'm not sure, um, but if I had a goal, it would just be that mining has commenced before the end of 2023. And it, there's a realistic chance that mining could have been going for a few months by before the end of uh, 2023. Okay. Thank you. Um, Paul's asking, what inflationary cost pressures are you seeing in 2022 so far? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, not that much. Uh, part of this is like, so from a, a diesel perspective, gas prices, how Mexico deals with gas is they look at things on kind of a, with setting prices is, is they look at everything on kind of a three year rolling basis. So when, when prices collapse, we really didn't see the benefit of that. But now that they're going up, we've actually only seen a modest you know, single digit percent increase in our gas prices there for our contractor uh, and the small carbon plant that we operate. So that's been pretty minimal. Um, reagent costs like cyanide and lime, um, and we have low consumption of both, but, you know, they've been modest. They probably have added, you know, maybe $20, $25 an ounce in terms of cost. Um, it's an interesting one because I said this in, in, in a meeting I had recently, there was, there was a whole big thing a couple of months ago or six weeks ago about a, uh, with, uh, a big Czech Republic company that produces a lot of cyanide shutting down their plant and they were producing it for use in the mining sector and everything else, shutting down their plant because of high energy costs in Europe. And you know, our cyanide um, is produced in Mexico. There isn't a supply chain issue, but it's a, it's an interesting example of 
there are genuine supply chain issues which are going to lead to some cost inflation and the more the advanced planning required to mitigate those um lead long lead item ordering you'll want to start a little earlier a good example drip lines for pads um dripping your cyanide solution over your or i mean we're talking plastic pipe here um and our pipe supplier normally our drip line supplier normally you'd call up two weeks later you'd have your pipe and um in uh, as a courtesy to us a few months ago he he said to us by the way if you're needing drip lines you know i need three to four months um it wasn't the price of the drip lines was going up but you had to be prepared for the time it was going to take to get certain things and so we get a lot of lessons we're learning from just operating Santana will be very, very helpful for Cerro de Aurora, including a lot of lead order items that we want to have well in advance, just to ensure the the smooth uh, transition of, of, of building that and starting up that operation. Um, and so, you know, cyanide, we've seen a slight price increase, but that's not because of any other reason than those Mexican suppliers are seeing the cost of cyanide going into North America and saying, well, you've got to pay, buy from us because you don't want to be paying those prices. So they, they're using it a little. Elizabeth Warren would be saying, here's an example of price gouging. There's a bit of price gouging going on. You know, and look, a lot of these companies have probably struggled like a lot of people in society over the last couple of years. Can I blame them a little? No, I can't. But uh, overall, uh, we're not seeing much in the way of cost inflation. We are absolutely as vulnerable as anyone else to breakdowns in the supply chain. Um, and so I think the key considerations are always to be ahead of that. And that means being very well informed with your suppliers so you can get ahead of supply chain issues. That's really interesting. Um, Ken's asking, do you see Monero Almos as a buyout target? Uh, no, I don't actually. I mean, I, maybe people like a liquidity event. Um, we're about building a, a new significant gold producer. Um, and, you know, that's that's something I think that there's room for in the market. Um, and so whilst we sometimes as investors, and I'm an investor in this space as well, um, sometimes we, we love the idea of a liquidity event. I'll give you an example of one where I think there was a, when when Darren and his team built Castle Gold, um, and they built that very similar to Santana or what Cerador is going to be. Um, you know, it started on a three hundred thousand ounce resource. They built it for seven million US. Um, started out as a twenty five thousand ounce a year operation, and two years later, it got bought out for $130 million. And during that time, they'd increased the resource to 1.2 million ounces. The profile was 50,000 ounces a year, and it was heading to 75. And it got bought out by Argonaut. It was a bit of an arranged marriage. There were some shareholders still feeling the hurt after the GFC. Um, so in 2010, Argonaut Gold bought them for $130 million. They also bought a company called Pediment Gold that had the La Colorada project. And I think they paid about $160 million for that. So roughly $300 million in combined acquisitions. In very short order, relatively short order, Argonaut had gone to a billion-dollar market cap. So, I mean, you can kind of ask yourself the question, as shareholders of those companies, how much money did you leave on the table taking the liquidity event? Um, you know, it's my job to, to show that, you know, we are better poised to continue to add value uh, off our own hard work than succumbing to something. But I think uh, the very boot nature of bootstrapping these operations means a potential acquirer just doesn't have the line of sight on, on the resource that we do and, and stuff. So so I, I don't think so, honestly. Um, but I, I, I'd also just couch that by saying, just because I believe that we can build um, a great new gold producer off the foundation that we put in place now, um, 
we will always, always think about things from all shareholders' perspectives and not our own desires to lead this charge to build the next great big thing. So, you know, whilst I, I personally think that that is a, a, uh, a path that is best serving our shareholders, I am but one voice for six and a half million shares of, of 448. It's a very, I'm a very small voice in this, you know, it's our shareholders at large we have to think about, so. Um, next question is, what will the Cerro de Oro PEA cost? Oh, it won't cost much at all. And the reason is that you're not going to see a PEA, like our PEA for Fortuna was done by CSA. Um, this PEA will be of 43101 standard, co-authored by a number of expert QPs in their respective fields. Uh, all independent QPs co-authoring a report. It won't have some glossy logo on the front cover, but it will have every single page and every bit of data you would see in a report produced by an SRK or a CSA or a JDS or, or whoever. Um, and will be done with a degree of conservatism that, you know, uh, will not have anyone questioning approaching it from, from that perspective. After all, when, you, when you're going to a SRK or a JDS or a whoever, it's, it's basically authored by a whole series of independent professionals, you know, working under that umbrella in their respective fields. So, you know, this, this will be no different. It just won't have a company logo on the front. It will have, you know, the credentials of the, the three or four uh, QPs required to, that will have done the work to put it together. So um, that's why we can think about, you know, putting something out in Q3, um, because this is not going to be a long process. It will be a diligent process, um, and, and it will be a very cost-effective process as a result. Right. All right, thank you. I want to close out with this question from Ben here. Apart from declaring commercial production on Santana and obtaining the rights at Cerro de Oro, what would you say are the main catalysts shareholders should look forward to for the rest of 2022? Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a good question. People always ask about catalysts, and I've I've actually uh, I I get for good reason a lot of people are hanging on when's commercial production, when's commercial production at Santana, and I've I've pointed them to a lot of companies where I think there's been a a haste to make that declaration, and we're not in a hurry to do so. Um, it, I think by taking our time to get there, it will be more impactful. So it is a genuine catalyst, uh, but it's one of many this year. Um, those surface rights are key because they, they start the ball rolling for us being able to talk about a lot more about Cerro Doro, for us doing the, the PEA on it, for getting the permits in. So it, that all starts. It's the biggest gating item for Cerro de Oro and why it's been a source of frustration um, that I've had to kind of see to, okay, it's better to do it, to do it right than rushed. Um, it is the gating item for news flow at Cerro de Oro. Um, so that, that to me, when I look at our whole business model, um, it's funny, I, you know, I'm sure people think well, it's got to be commercial production, the most significant catalyst. I actually think the surface rights at Cerro de Oro are. Um, and so in terms of the rest of the year, I think the biggest catalyst thereafter um, is actually going to be the PEA and Cerro de Oro, because I sure as hell I'm going to enjoy actually being able to talk real numbers. Um, I don't want our shareholders to have to guess. Uh, the PEA is going to clear all that up. Um, and if it's even close to our internal modeling, um, everyone should be very, very surprised. And I think it will be a, a, a major, major catalyst for the company. Um, so, you know, we're also going to be doing quite a bit of exploration this year in the second half. But I think in the short term, Surface rights at Cerro de Oro, then commercial production at Santana, then um, CDOs, uh, 
PEA, I think, would be the, the first three things on deck to, to really watch out for. All right. Well, thank you so much, Doug, for taking us through the update and obviously this live Q&A. Thank you, everyone, for joining and who submitted questions. If you do have other questions following the summit, feel free to reach out directly to Monero Almos. The email is here on this slide. Um, and of course, there's more information on their website, um, moneraamos.com. And as always, this has been recorded, so you can rewatch it on six.com. But before I close out, I'm just going to pass it back to you, Doug, if you have any final remarks. Um, no, I appreciate everyone uh, being here today. I hope it was a good use of your time. Um, not not only the info at Monero Alamos email address, I pride myself and in fact love it when people want to reach out directly to me. I think as investors in this business, you should be doing that more. <laughs> you know, you should be challenging CEOs and presidents of the companies, calling them out on stuff, um, you know, and, and making sure you can reach them because we serve at your pleasure. So uh, at the bottom of every press release, there is my cell phone number and my email address. Uh, don't be a stranger. If there are questions that uh, today or at any time in the future you want to ask, I am always available. Um, and uh, if I can't get back to you uh, when you call, you'll, you'll get a call back within 24 hours. So um, anyway, with that, uh, good luck in the markets out there. It's, it's a bit of a uh choppy old time we're we're dealing with so uh i hope that the markets are treating you well and thank you again mm -hmm.